Well, thank you all for uh, coming out in such cold weather uh, and coming to this, this uh, first faculty, elect faculty lectureship this semester. Um, I want to thank a couple of people first off. Um, I see Manny right there in the back. Uh, the, we always do the traditional uh, introduction to the selection committee. They're the individuals who took the applications and decide who was going to be presenting. And Dr. Dal Parto, Dr. Ebenuk, Dr. Starr, Dr. Varela, and Dr. Zhang. I want to thank them for uh, basically getting our, our, our uh, presenters today. Um, and uh, there'll be another one in next month, actually just one month from now. Also, a, a thank you to John Hauser and Calm Services uh, for facilitating the streaming of this lecture. Uh, that way we can have both best of both worlds. Um, and traditionally I introduce the, uh, the presenter, but since there are presenters this time, I'll let Dr. Jeff Gentry, who's sort of the lead in the first chair of this, introduce his team and then we'll proceed with the lecture. There will be refreshments, I'm told, at the end. Uh, after questions, we'll, we'll have the, the, the presentation, we'll open for a discussion and lectures, and then we'll basically continue the discussions uh, over refreshments. So thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, Dr. Montgomery. And yes, um, our team includes myself, Dr. Jason Evanick in Educational Studies, Ivana Mali in Biology, and uh, Fanchira M.J. Suryamankul, uh, also in Biology, who is an ENMU graduate in the Master's Program and now is a PhD candidate at Southern Illinois University. So I've always been fascinated by geography, including my MA thesis, and I noticed when I lived in Oklahoma, it was harder to get up in the morning than it is now in eastern New Mexico. So I started thinking as a geography interested person, what about longitude? Can longitude have something to do with a person's quality of life or feelings of well-being? Well, in Oklahoma, I had to do a lot of driving, and with a low heart rate, it's very easy for me to fall asleep. But I noticed when I moved to New Mexico, it was easier to wake up in the morning, and it was easier for me to stay awake when driving long distances. So I, the gears started turning, and, and so I, I started wondering what effect uh, a position within a time zone or within uh, across longitudes might be. And so I began looking, this was uh, in about 2018, I began looking for a dependent variable that might be able to uh, be manipulated in order to find out if it matters how soon the sun comes up in relation to your clock time. So my fear of sleep driving uh, made me think of that. What about highway fatalities? Would that be a dependent variable that could explain uh, why somebody living in one place might have an easier time uh, with their sleep cycles and their, um, their chronobiology than somewhere else? So I had the nugget of a study. Then I thought, hey, this is a geography project, and I know that Jason Evanick is a geographer, so why not bring him in? And Dr. Evanick thought, okay, well, he knew, and I didn't, that Dr. Ivana Mali has access to GIS software, which she uses in her field studies in biology. And then Dr. Mali brought in MJ Suryamankul to help with data input and analysis. So uh, it really became a team thing, and that's really what I wanted was, um, you know, all the really sexy research, I think, happens in teams rather than the germ of, a, of an individual. So, that's where we are today. Dr. Evanek and I will uh, present the, uh, the research, and then uh, Dr. Molly, and I, I think that MJ is with us uh, uh, through the YouTube link. And so anyway, we all are available for the Q&A session. So, um, if we notice on our first slide here, uh, this is just to be very up to date. There's been an increase in traffic deaths under COVID-19 since, uh, since 2020. We have this spike in motor vehicle deaths. So um, 
this topic is very important. Uh, about 35,000 Americans die every year on the highways, which is just a tragedy. And, and it did jump. Some uh, theorists think maybe it has something to do with um, frustration and anger about, about COVID-19, that maybe people aren't as polite on the roads. But anyway, this doesn't really represent the long-term trend, though, because this graph starts in 1980. And today's, you know, not counting this new blip, but generally speaking, we have only half of the per capita highway fatalities nowadays that we did in 1980. So this graph just shows the year-to-year -year variation. Uh, but highway deaths are a serious matter. And so I ask you, uh, what do you think might be some contributing factors, other than, say, COVID-19, but in a normal year, what might contribute to highway fatalities? Time of day. The time of day. Early morning has a higher risk of fatalities than midday. Late at night, you bet. Any any others? Alcohol. Alcohol, drunk driving, absolutely. Weather conditions. Weather, yeah, bad weather can, can affect it. There's one more biggie that I would want us to mention. Distracted. Distracted driving, cell phones and, uh, and uh, kids fighting in the back seat. So those are all things that contribute. So uh, highway fatalities are a very complex dependent variable. And so uh, there is some outstanding research on what might contribute to negative health effects based on time. And so this is Till Ronneberg. He is a Munich, Germany theorist who has really taken the torch and helped society understand chronobiology and what he calls the social jet lag hypothesis. And this is a really powerful hypothesis. According to Ronneberg, we receive two hours less sleep per night today in the Western world than we did 150 years ago. So before the incandescent lamp, before Thomas Edison's light bulb, we, and in Western society, slept two hours more than we do today. And you can imagine that that is quite a significant difference. And he developed the social jet lag, lag hypothesis to try to explain some maladies that affect some people more than others. And so um, his hypothesis is, in the social jet lag hypothesis, that this constructed environment uh, with alarm clocks and electric lights and the news coming on at 10 o'clock no matter what and schools, uh, school start times being set rigidly at 8 in the morning, this constructed environment, which is not necessarily natural, leads to what, um, what my colleagues and I call dysfunctional social time that it creates a time universe that is not conducive to good health, right? And then Ronneberg says this leads to circadian misalignment, where we're getting our sleep at the wrong times, where we are eating when we should be sleeping, and we are sleeping at times that are not functional, and generally getting not enough sleep. And so it isn't just how much sleep, but when we get it, because the, the, the solar clock the sun is the most important factor that helps entrain or provide us with what we need to sleep so that we can sleep when we need to sleep and be awake when we need to awake. And Ronneberg says that this circadian misalignment creates a host of physical and social maladies, some of which you can see right here. And, um, and I'm hoping that folks watching can see all the words here so I don't repeat them all. But things like sleep deprivation, obesity, uh, dementia, and could traffic deaths be another result of social jet lag? That is what we're curious about. Um, is it conceivable that social jet lag could manifest itself in traffic fatalities? And if so, could one's location within a time zone have something to do with the social jet lag that would cause a higher rate of fatalities. So, directly, and I just don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but we did find some very specific research that edged us closer to our hypothesis. And that is, of course, Ronneberg 
and others, uh, Gu, Cantrum, and Ant, Gu and Cantrumman found research that said that someone's location in a time zone, in other words, if they're at the far western extreme of their time zone, they're worse off. And in terms of cancer and heart disease. Then Smith looked at daylight saving time, and he, he concluded, based on his research, that in the United States we have 30 additional deaths on the highways because of the transition to daylight saving in the spring, when we're all tired because we have to get an, up an hour earlier. Okay? And then, the big one, this made international headlines and got me going, uh-oh, I better get working on this research or somebody's going to beat us to it, when Giantella and Mazona uh, found health impacts of social jet lag at time zone boundaries. They found higher cancer, higher obesity, and uh, worse health outcomes for folks on the, well, what would be the east edge of a time zone boundary compared to the west edge. In other words, folks in Amarillo would have a worse time of it than folks in Portales because we're on the eastern edge of our time zone, they're on the western edge of theirs. And so they found a pretty strong link between being on the wrong side of the time zone boundary and health effects, right? So, that takes us to our study, which we are really excited about because we were able to look and do hard science, right? Uh, Jason and I don't always get to do hard science the way Ivana and MJ do, and truly interdisciplinary research because we're looking at the science of biology, the social science of geography, geography and the art of rhetoric, because our argument is that time zones are rhetorical. This really captures theoretically the, the problem. These black lines represent what should be our time zone boundaries. Eastern time, central time, mountain time, and Pacific time. They all follow the 15 degrees of latitude or longitude that the sun tells us is a 24-hour day. But notice how many of these white counties are west of the barrier. These are in eastern time, but should not be in eastern time, right? And I could understand some maneuvering, but look how extreme the time zone boundary is, and they always push west. In central time, central time should end here. More than half of Texas should be in mountain time. But the poor folks in Amarillo are getting up before dawn most of the year, and then with daylight saving time, you're going to compound that by another hour for two-thirds of the year. In mountain time, this is what should be mountain time, but look at all of these yellow counties west of the barrier. Pacific time doesn't have any uh, of these weird uh, locations, these counties in what we call eccentric time localities. Maybe they're better off. So, not having any idea what the data were going to say, we hypothesized that a misaligned time zone could lead to abnormal circadian entrainment consistent with social jet lag, that this might impair driving acuity, just as uh, Dr. Montgomery mentioned, that the time of day can affect driving uh, acuity, and that's true, that impaired driving because of social jet lag is going to increase driver accidents, which might tend to push higher traffic fatalities. So, let's look at the, is this research able to be found? Absolutely, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration in the United States provides a, a, a fatality analysis reporting system, a FARS census, that very reliably tells us where people are dying on the highways. So, um, what our study, or what we did with our study is we took a look at all um, traffic accidents, or tra traffic fatalities that occurred between 2004 and 2018. So we looked at every single one of them, and we basically used GIS to kind of plot um, and GIS is a, um, stands for Geographic Information Systems, to identify where they took place. Now, we didn't necessarily map where we they took place, but we pulled the, um, the data from that, and we were able to determine 
were those fatalities occurring in what we determined were solar? Maybe if we can go back to that map. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Perfect. Um, so we were able to determine were they occurring in what we determined as the, the natural time zones, and we, we referred to that as solar natural. And then these areas, for example, the central time zone here, that like most of Texas actually, we determined that this was eccentric times, we re referred to it as eccentric time zone locations. So sure, it's in central, but it shouldn't be. According to the natural 15 degree demarcations from starts from the prime meridian in England, this is central time zone right here. So everything that you see that's outside, and it's going to be uh, west side of the time zone, these are eccentric, eccentric locations. So we, we looked particularly at these eccentric locations for eastern, for central, and then not as much for western, and you can imagine the population is also lower in the western, but there was still data that we could evaluate. We looked at every single one of them, and um, here's our finding. So I, oh, I skipped a map, didn't I? Well, these are just the specific okay. ETFs. Okay, kind of did the job that I sure. <laughs> forgot about that slide. Okay, Thank sorry you. about that. Uh, all right, so when we looked at the data, what we found was very substantial. Um, we saw that ETLs were, in fact, significantly worse in terms of their um, automobile fatalities. We saw 21.9% um, higher rates of automobile fatalities occurred in these eccentric time zone locations. Um, so that alone we felt like was compelling enough. I mean, we're looking at every single, I mean, we're not drawing inferences from the, from the population here, we've got the population. We have the census, if you will, from 2004 to 2018. Um, we did do some additional tests on that 21.9%, um, particularly that we looked at the Cohen's D, um, which for an effect size is, is quite substantial. Um, with an effect size of 0.823, um, this basically told us that there is a 0.8 of a standard deviation uh, difference between solar uh, school, uh, fatality rates and ETL fatality rates. So um, we saw that as a number that really demonstrates the magnitude of, uh, of our findings here. When we looked at the correlation, the linear correlation, we did not see um, uh, a very, I, I guess it would be a very low effect, uh, or excuse me, not effect, um, but a relationship or correlation um, when we looked at the two um, kind of on a linear uh, correlation. Um, what we also did is we kind of broke it out by um, time zone, and we saw that the pattern was pretty consistent across um, time zone, whether we're looking at eastern, whether it's central, whether we're looking at mountain. Um, now, when you look at this slide, you do see numerically it's really eastern that's driving the data, and the primary reason for that is just simply numbers. The population is, is substantially higher in the eastern time zone. So it's really um, that time zone that's driving the data the most. Now, what we did when we calculated um, the, th the rates for each, for the ETLs versus the solar, we were then, with that rate, able to come up with an estimated unexpected death, an actual death number. The, uh, so in this case, 11,239 deaths is really what the difference is between these two rates. So, um, which we believe this number is very substantial. Um, we also wanted to take a look, and I guess we, there was a map. I think, you know, I think the map, there you go. 
sorry, I'm kind of all over the place okay. a little bit. Um, one of the things that we decided early on is we were very concerned that if we compared rural um, automobile fatalities with urban, that it, it's very hard to make generalizations in very different contexts. So what we did is we actually also examined the data um, comparing urban with urban, rural with rural, as well as micropolitan area with micropolitan area. Now, census kind of doesn't help us. The Census Bureau that collects all this data doesn't give us a lot of help here in terms of their county designations. Those who study in, in demography and, and spatial analysis, many, many have con, um, complained for years that these census de designations by county level don't break it down quite well enough for it. Uh, so. The way the census uses their data is they basically establish two major areas, micro, or metropolitan areas, which is areas that are urban areas of 50,000 or larger, or um, you can have a 100,000 metropolitan area. So you say a city is only 30,000, but if you include all the areas around it, it adds up to 100. That, that gets included as well. Um, and all of the commuter counties associated would count as a metropolitan area. So the, that's why you see it's never just one county that's a metropolitan area. It's often a collection of them. Um, well, micropolitan areas, um, these are areas that are uh, between 10,000 and 50,000. So let's think about that for a minute. Is all of southeast area, uh, New Mexico uh, non-rural? Absolutely not. So that, that, that's an example of a problem. It's less pronounced in the eastern part of the United States because counties are so small in there, and they become more accurate at that point. But where you have large counties in the west, you, you do um, have some data difficulties. All that aside, we still wanted to look at rural versus rural, micropolitan versus micropolitan, as well as metropolitan versus metropolitan. So, when we did that, we were quite surprised, I think it's the next one, oh, I'm sorry, oh, there it is. Um, we were quite surprised by what we found when we looked at that. We saw that the ETLs were uh, substantially worse in the metropolitan areas as well as the rural areas, but the micropolitan areas, not as much. Um, we discussed that a, a, a little bit in our in our um, conclusions, but um, the, the thought the thought is here with the micropolitan. Well, if our hypothesis is that solar jet lag from these time zones, eccentric time zones, is leading to more automobile fatalities, <laughs> then I think it's logical to say that longer drive times are going to be a factor in that solar entrainment. Well, where do you have long drive times? Well, rural areas are known for having very long drive times um, due to workers, you know, driving often to uh, 50 to 100 miles per day for work. Uh, we even see that around us um, here in this county. Um, as well as metropolitan areas, um, you get the, the more of the lengthy commute times there as well. Micropolitan areas might just be kind of that nice spot where you don't have as many of the long commute times, um, just simply because of the uh, kind of that nice medium size to it. So that's that's a, a possible reason for why ETLs actually were a tad bit better in terms of automobile fatalities. Um, that was the only data point in the entire study that really didn't support uh, our hypothesis. So that was, I guess, the, the potential conclusion on, on that number. So more meaningful conclusions, though, I'll let um, Dr. Gentry speak to that. Great. Thank you. So we had some conclusions from our research that you can see here uh, that we're pretty excited about that uh, 
Dr. Ronneberg would be very pleased to see that, um, that our research supports the social jet lag hypothesis, extending it to include uh, longitude. That 21.9% that higher vehicle fatality rate in the uh, eccentric time localities shocked us. Uh, with the large number of unexpected deaths that you can see there, 1,285 per year. Um, and so to compare, uh, Wright in his study was very concerned about the transition to daylight saving time in the spring. And he, uh, his research suggests that 30 people die on American highways each year because of the transition to the spring uh, daylight saving time. Compare those 30 to 1,285. Uh, it is a massive correlation or a massive uh, indication that living in Amarillo is more dangerous than living in Clovis. Living in Muleshoe is more dangerous than living in Portales. Now, I say that on the macro level. Now, I did today just look, and that's also true of these specific counties, right? Folks who live on the bad sunset side, as Giantella and Mazzoni call it, are worse off. But not only on the borders, but throughout the eccentric time localities. And those deaths, using a conservative formula from Blinko and the NHTSA, where each highway fatality is, um, has an economic effect of $1.4 million dollars, in lost wages and healthcare wasted costs and uh, lack of productivity, um, you know, in straight economic terms, that would add up to $1.8 billion each year because of a bad time zone boundary. And we looked further, and I spoke to my statistics uh, professor from long ago, uh, Amy Johnson at the University of Oklahoma, and she said, well, you know, on COVID, they're talking about years of lives life lost. The average person who dies of COVID-19 loses 13 years of life, and that is very tragic. Um, so that means that the average COVID death is at age 65, and the average American lifespan or life expectancy would be 78, so that's 13 years. But a highway death, each highway death averages age 40. And so you can see how tremendous it is. The um, Highway fatalities are the 13th leading cause of death in the United States. But in years of life, life lost, highway fatalities are number seven. So you can see how many years each highway death on average costs individuals. Uh, so we're talking about a very important uh, addition to the social jet lag research. Now, we do have some limitations on our study that we want to report. And that is, you know, the fact that we had a, an 11% Pearson correlation between ETL and, and fatalities, um, for something as complex as highway fatalities with all those factors that we talked about, and, and random factors, and just bad luck factors, the fact that we got 11% correlation between ETL and highway traffic fatalities is really quite important, I think. But it isn't as though... <laughs> it's a thousand times worse. It's only 21.9% worse to be in an ETL. Um, but we find that shocking. And the, the Cohen's DS effect size of 0.823, as <coughs> Dr. Evanick said, almost a full standard deviation. But we did find also that those vehicle fatality rate differences were not consistent across all of the census designations. And I'm intrigued by your thought that perhaps the micropolitan is in that sweet spot where there might be enhanced safety. But um, we did find that there, in those particular areas, uh, there was no protection provided by uh, the solar natural zone. However, the statistical significance was not met, right? So it's not that it was significantly worse to be in, an, in a solar zone in that case. But we did find that there was no major urban primacy effect. It wasn't that urban areas were driving uh, the, the differences. You saw that 26.5% uh, in the eastern zone uh, 
16, 17% in the central zone, uh, and 21 plus percent in the mountain zone, in each time zone where ETLs exist, they were substantially and significantly worse. You may be curious about that Pacific time zone. We don't have a slide for that, but the Pacific time zone, which has no ETLs, by far the safest time zone in the United States. One thing I neglected to say at the beginning, um, we did remove Alaska, Hawaii, and Arizona. So some of you might be thinking uh, that a little bit. And the question is why? Um, why not include all 50? Um, I know Alaska and Hawaii gets, you know, they always, uh, you know, they don't like being left out of everything. And here we are perpetuating this. So it creates a whole new set of difficulties when in that analyzing those because they're kind of out there on their own. And this is, we're looking at the relationship from one time zone to the next. So that lack of a conterminous time zone effect. Um, Arizona, why Arizona? Well, there, Arizona removed daylight savings time. And by doing that, it kind of muddied up our analysis going from one time zone to the next as well. So it, um, we did talk about possibly looking at Arizona as a sort of control. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we can easily look at that. Uh, so that may be explored later. Mm -hmm. But I, I forgot to mention right. that. Yeah, so they have ETLs, but they, um, except for the Indian um, reservations there, um, Arizona doesn't have the added problem of daylight savings. So these are our recommendations here. We're coming back to the communication side of it, the policy side, the rhetorical side. Um, and so Dr. Bruss might be very interested in some of these. Uh, that unlike uh, Giantella and Mazona, we have uh, some pretty strong policy recommendations. Uh, of course, we think we should uh, continue to research this issue, including things like um, educational outcomes. Do ETLs create problems educationally for these students who have to go to school in the dark? Um, the health effects that we've seen from social jet lag, um, such as cancer, obesity, um, and dementia, are those worse in ETLs? That's a fruitful area of biological research. We also think that this research should extend to uh, ETLs worldwide, because for example in Europe, they have wackier time zones even than we do. And even Ronneberg, uh, without doing research yet, said that we have to look at the possibility that, um, that time zones may be uh, a factor in social jet lag. And policy recommendations, move time zone boundaries east. There is no reason for Amarillo and Lubbock to be in central time. And we kind of speculate, part of the reason maybe uh, they're not in mountain time is Texans don't think of themselves as mountain people. It might be the semantics of our time zone names. Maybe we should call it the west central time zone rather than the mountain time zone because of where it actually lies, and the mountains are only a small part of that. Um, we, we would suggest that in accordance with uh, chronobiology theory, that if we move those time zone boundaries eastward, that people would be able to entrain themselves using uh, Zeitgebirs, uh, Zeitgebirs, such as the sun, which are ways that the body regulates when it's time to go to bed and when it's time to get up. And we are way better off in Portales, New Mexico, being slightly east. There's almost no places that are east of central of, of the time zone. We're even a few minutes uh, east of the mountain time zone uh, center. And finally, if, if we can't move those time zones, then school systems and stores uh, in places like Amarillo and Lubbock should start at 8.30 rather than, than 8 o'clock because in Amarillo, they are a full hour and 40, for two-thirds of the year, they are an hour and 45 minutes off of their time zone. That's a lot. That is uh, very important. So if they just moved school start times to 8.30 instead of 8, that would uh, take care of some of that lapse. And the last recommendation is be careful out there. Highway deaths, 35,000 Americans die each year on in their cars or because of cars. And this is a good reminder that we need to be very careful about highway traffic safety. And we even had a tragedy at ENMU just recently on this issue. Um, and there's a quotation there that I think speaks for itself. Um, 
So in conclusion, chronobiology theory, oh yeah, and these are our key sources. Um, <coughs> Dr. Evanick put 11 of our 33 sources. These are the key sources. If anybody wants to see any of this material, please let us know. But chronobiology theory is highly heuristic. In our case, we hypothesize the existence of a phenomenon based on established theory. We looked for it, and we found it. We agree, therefore, with Ronneberg, who argues it is time that the profound knowledge of clock research reaches everyone in our society. Interdisciplinary research such as this can help support theory building in communication, biology, and geography while sparking better informed social policy. Thank you for your attention today. And we're all handy. 36 minutes, that's not too bad, Dr. Montgomery, right? We have some time, time for questions. We have plenty of time because they haven't gotten the stuff here yet. Oh, okay. That's more than a so, I don't know if you want to stand with the picture. Dr. Molly, if you want to come closer. <laughs> yes, Dr. Lorenz. Uh, uh, first of all, thanks for the presentation. Very interesting data. Um, you know, in terms of your data set, did you look at times of accidents, fatalities, in, in terms of trying to explain what you're seeing? Um, in essence, um, and I know you all you put some good citations up there, you know, in terms of the circadian clock and reentrainment of the circadian clock, um, you know, the, the diurnal rhythms in uh, hormones is, is extremely important in terms of sleep-wake cycles. Uh, was it pr more pronounced in differences in early morning than it would be in afternoon and, and later in the day? We did not look at that. We don't have the data for that. I'll see. Okay. However, um, we're assuming that in each time zone, things are going to be similar in terms of, you know, yes, uh, we do know that according to Wright, there are more accidents in the morning yeah. than there are in the afternoon and more accidents in the late evening. But uh, we had to assume that that would come out through the wash and there wouldn't be any specific reasons why ETLs would have a worse morning than somebody else. But Dr. Molly, would you want to talk to the science? Well, yeah, I don't think we have the data available even no. to look at that because the data set that we have doesn't show the time of oh, okay. each fatality. They okay. just give us a summary of total per year, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And to kind of speak to that, one thing we were discussing a bit when we were talking about this yesterday is the next study really should address, should, should we go that direction? We, what we'd like to do is do a more in-depth dive into a sa into sample ETLs and sample perfectly solar counties and to look at every single fatality that actually occurred there for things like time of occurrence, cause of, of mm -hmm. um, you know, police reports even, um, fatigue. So what, what uh, led to the, auto, you know, was someone on the phone? Was it, um, you know, the being tired, that sort of thing. So we would like to kind of take a case study approach and sample some ETLs and solar counties and, and kind of take that deep dive. Okay. Yes. You know, I'm just kind of curious about um, whether you might be able to have identified any factors that you might attribute to that spike you saw during the pandemic. I mean, uh, you didn't identify, uh, address those, but I was just kind of curious about what insights you might have towards what right, might have yeah. caused those higher numbers of uh, fatalities yeah. during the pandemic. Right. Well, I saw that article two days ago and thought just for timeliness it would be interesting. But the, the authors, you know, this is like brand new data, and so it's only speculation, but the, the author of the article that I just read two days ago said that it could be frustration and um, anger, you know, basically uh, COVID fatigue that might reduce driver acuity. Dr. Brutzel. Oh uh, yeah, well thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Um, and I, I, I guess it's a follow-up <laughs> to uh, Vice President Lorenz's question. Um, it's just Jamie in this room. Jamie, not, <laughs> not quite sure. Uh, and also forgive me because I, I don't have a statistics background, so maybe it's kind of answered sort of, I don't know. Um, 
And then secondly, I'm, I'm from Hawaii, so all, just to wrap my head around daylight savings, it's, I've, I never get it, so every two times a year I have to think it through what, what exactly I'm doing each, you know, in November, and is it back or forward? Um, so, but it see, it, uh, how do you control for all these other possible factors? You know, that, and like you said, there could be so many of them. And it seems like you were kind of alluding, maybe you, do you have to do that case-by-case case analysis to really say that this is really a significant, that the ETL is a significant factor? Because you've got to rule those other things out. Or is it somehow ruled out statistically through your statistical programs or something? And then kind of related, the underlying thing, what is the underlying cause of the, is it the lack of sleep, uh, which creates problems in ability to stay stay focused, uh, or or not, or what is, is the actual cause that you're that you're getting at? So I'll take the first part of that and let you go with. I, I know you've got something sure. um, on your mind too. So the. With doing a census, an entire census of every single traffic death allows us to, now granted a lot of those traffic deaths had nothing to do with solar entrainment, and we know that, but you would, theoretically, the, the type of deaths that are occurring in a, in a uh, solar area, um, you're, you're going to have DUI, you're going to have, um, you, know, rate, you know, driving too fast, all, all these reasons in a solar as well as an ETL. So that, that stays the same across the board. So then the question is, why is it then that the ETLs have the higher rate? You know, and that deep dive will help answer that. Our suspicion is solar entrainment um, because we know all those other factors are going to be present everywhere. So then it brings us back to the question, why are they so much higher in the ETL? The common denominator yep. is eccentric time locality. And another way to put it, since we have a full census, we have every single death, things are going to come out in the wash, hypothetically or theoretically. And so I would suggest that if there were any drug on the market that carried a 21% higher death rate than another, that drug would be taken off the market immediately. And I would argue that these eccentric time zones should be taken off the market immediately. The other thing to answer theoretically, that's what this chart tries to show, is that if you have a misaligned time zone, that's going to disrupt normal circadian entrainment. Okay? And boom, there's so much research that abnormal circadian entrainment is bad news. right? Um, and so it creates obesity, higher rates of obesity, dementia, cancer, uh, heart disease and uh, uh, diabetes and all of that. Um, and we would suggest, based on the correlations that we found, impaired driving acuity, because people are, are sleeping when they should be awake, and they're awake when they should be sleeping. They're not entrained to the sun the way humans have been for 200,000 years. It was only 150 years ago that we started messing with this and having two hours less sleep and in our case drawing time zone boundaries that really don't make sense. So if if this is true, absolutely impaired driving acuity is going to create driver accidents and some of those accidents are going to be fatal. Or, and I don't know if MJ is able to, if she wants to speak up at any point, um, but Mr. Hauser is looking there. So um, but did anybody else want to comment? Well, she's there for sure, so I'm sure she'll maybe type it out in comments if she okay. has anything to say. But also on the statistical side, there are more sophisticated ways to can take multiple factors into account if that data becomes available as we do. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, Dr. Evanick already mentioned that we can try to look at granularity as a next step. Yeah, and I think in the next, if we did a deep dive case study, we could do a, a something in the regression where we are, we're trying to parse out those factors and saying, okay, what percentage of this deaths can be predicted by this factor? 
you know, and, and it would allow us to kind of remove those other components. So that, I think that deep dive is really probably what's needed to fully answer the question, but I would still argue that 21% is, is shining the light on something. Okay, thank you. I see people out there. With yeah, they're almost snacks. they're out there. I have one more question. Yes. Have you thought about the control? Because the the actual comparison with the, either the number or the rate has such a large number that that effect uh, gets kind of swamped in the statistics so far. But I'm curious as to what we would identify as a control to be able to to get rid of some of the complexity of the etiology. In other words, that control might allow you to, to the, do that deep dive even better. Have you just thought about it at all? Or? I think there was some more. Didn't we have the idea of Arizona at one point? Yeah, we could, we could look at Arizona, for example, as a control. Or, I mean, we already have a control in the Pacific time zone. <laughs> I mean, less than 0 .001 compared to an average of 0 .013. Um, I'm saying that a little bit wrong. Uh, 0 0.130 is the national average, the ETL 0 0.00165. In other words, it's only 50, 55%. In other, okay, but and compared to ETLs, the Pacific, thank you, Pacific time zone has half the deaths per capita compared to all of the ETLs. So th that's one control. But yeah, absolutely, we could go into more epide epidemiological uh, research uh, that controls for more factors, but on the macro level, you know, we've got some very shocking uh, results here. Uh, I, I would suggest mm -hmm. that the Pacific would not be a good control for you. The actual control would be the counties, etc., in the natural versus uh, across the map. Right. Because you're going to find exactly differences by zone. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Most sophisticated question here. How did you deal with fatalities of residents not in that zone, but in the total coverage? Right. Um, NHTSA uh, has that, and. I'm trying to remember if it mattered where the person was from. I don't think it mattered where the person was from, but people die at a higher rate in these counties. So that's not, you know, it's not like we don't know if they were on a cross country trip. But even if they were, the night before they were in an ETL, in all likelihood. But didn't have the characteristics of residents. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right. Again, we're looking at macro data, uh, and we can't tell you. Now, in my master's thesis, I looked at regional variation and communication apprehension, and I made the control that just because somebody went to college in a certain place didn't necessarily mean they represented that place. So I looked at their hometown, too, to make sure they were in a hometown that was in the same geographic region, cultural region. So, you know, that's a good way to control for that, but we couldn't do that in this so that's a sophisticated question. <laughs> that's a surprise. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm, we love celebrating faculty research, and we look forward to, um, is it Dr. Albright? Um, Allington. I'm sorry, I got his name wrong. Dr. Allington next semester. Yep. So uh, Next month. Next 23rd. It's, it's not next semester. It's in... March 23rd. You're suffering from an eccentric. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not just traffic fatalities. <laughs> so let's, let's give them another round.